It's Thursday, November 17th, and this is your Coffee Break on the HAN Network. I'm Kate Chaplinski with the latest local news, including the body of a missing Stanford man found yesterday, a water main break on I-95 this morning, and Wilton students allegedly chanting build the wall at a recent football game. We also have a preview of this week's front pages later in the show, and happy to have Kevin Coleman here today with your Nutmeg Sports Update. And of course, later on, Donald Eng will join us to take a look back on this day in history. But first, in a tragic update on a missing Stanford man, 26-year-old Joseph Camionale's body was found Wednesday in a shallow grave in a desolate area of the New Jersey shore. The New York Post reports a suspect was being questioned at a Manhattan station house Wednesday evening in connection with the murder of Camionale, who was killed in an apartment paid for by a jeweler to the stars, according to sources. James Rackover was in police custody but had not been charged in the gruesome slaying of Camionale, whose body was found days after he went missing. Rackover lives in the apartment on East 59th Street near First Avenue, where Camionale had been at a party on Saturday night. Police discovered the body in a shallow grave in Oceanport, New Jersey, on Wednesday morning. The Stanford man, a Hofstra University grad who worked as a sales associate at Tri-Ed Limited, had been stabbed nine times and had a broken pelvis. He had also been set on fire in a possible effort to cover up the crime and may have been thrown from a fourth floor window. Caminale had been hanging out at the Gilded Lily in Chelsea on Saturday and followed a group of friends to the party at that apartment. And in other news today, the Darien Times reporting this morning that Darien High School went into lock-in mode at 8.45 after a report of a sighting of a male dressed in camouflage in proximity of the high school. The district sent out a message to parents saying that this morning it was reported to administration that there was an individual dressed in camouflage in the woods surrounding the high school. As a result and as a precautionary measure, they went into lock-in mode. The Darien police arrived at the high school and investigated that report and by 9 10 this morning the police indicated that the building and grounds were safe the lock-in was lifted and a typical school day has resumed the move was just precautionary according to school superintendent dan brenner he noted that lock-in is different than lockdown mode lockdown mode means that students must stay in their places in school lock-in means that students can move about as normal within the school but they can't leave the building darian police sergeant jeremiah marin emphasized that there is no emergency and said that that mail had not been located. You can check for updates at DarianTimes.com. And a water main break caused a headache on I-95 this morning. The Darien Times reports that Peter Fazekas of Aquarian said that main was broken by a contractor working in the area and Aquarian was shutting down the water to make repairs. It was reported on the exit 10 ramp in Darien causing a traffic backup there. And in other news, a Darien man who is accused of trying to abduct a woman from her home in Stratford and burning her car was apprehended on Tuesday evening by New Canaan police at the man's place of employment on Pine Street. 29-year-old Pedro Oristanio of Darien was charged on Tuesday with criminal mischief, second-degree arson, along with threatening, attempted kidnapping, and unlawful restraint. Stratford police say officers responded on Tuesday to a domestic incident at a residence on King's College Place. Upon arrival, it was determined that Oristanio, described as an ex-boyfriend, had attempted to abduct the woman living there and had set fire to her vehicle, which was parked near the home. Police determined that Oristanio might be en route to one of three other towns, and with assistance from those other towns, he was taken into custody by New Canaan police. And the night of Friday, November 11th, the Wilton High School football team beat Darianne 28-0 and held a ceremony in honor of Veterans Day. But while some consider it a night of celebration, something else happened that has others concerned. During the game at Fujitani Field, a group of Wilton students were heard chanting, Build the Wall, a phrase commonly heard at Donald Trump's presidential campaign rallies, referring to the wall he said he would build at the United States-Mexico border to keep out immigrants. While minority enrollment at Wilton High is around 12 percent, the Wilton Bulletin reports that Danbury High School student body, a majority of whom are Hispanic, has a much higher rate. Wilton resident and father Kenneth Hoffman said that shouting build the wall at any game would be offensive, but while playing a school from a town with a higher Hispanic and African American population, it is obviously and simply racist, he said. 
Wilton resident and chair of the Wilton Interfaith Action Committee, Stephen Hudspeth, said he was shocked to hear what had happened at the game. He said even if it was a stupid and thoughtless jeer at an opposing team that has more minority and recent immigrant players than Wilton's team, it's ugly and it's stupid. He said what our country desperately needs now is coming together across all differences. In a letter on November 14th, Wilton High School principal Robert O'Donnell said parents and community members contacted him about the incident, which he said was committed by a small number of students. Based on reports from various students, Superintendent Kevin Smith told the Bulletin Wednesday morning that it sounded like the initiators of the chant were two male students. Although those students involved denied offensive intent, O'Donnell stated in his letter that they recognize that many will feel offended by this particular phrase. There's a lot more on that story at WiltonBulletin.com. And in other news, a raid of a spa in East Granby led to a prostitution charge for one woman. Connecticut State Police, with help from East Granby Police and Homeland Security, arrested Chinese national Chenggua Li, a 49-year-old currently living in Flushing, New York. The arrest was a result of a joint investigation into allegation that acts of prostitution were occurring at Healing Spa after the East Granby Police had received complaints. Detectives investigated and confirmed that employees of the salon did in fact commit acts of prostitution, according to police. And the Richfield Police Department is currently investigating two separate reports of larcenies from motor vehicles that took place between 415 and 445 Thursday, November 10th, at two different child care facilities in town. Captain Jeff Kreitz said in a press release that in both cases, an unknown individual entered the vehicles through an unlocked door and stole a pocketbook. He said at this point in the investigation, they have determined that the suspect parked in the parking lot and waited for the parent to exit their vehicle and go inside that child care facility. The suspect then went into the vehicle, stole the items, and left the scene. The suspect vehicle is a newer model Kia Sedona minivan, in white in color with an unknown out-of-state plate. Anyone with information can contact Richfield Police at 203-438-6531. Taking a quick look at the forecast, it's another beautiful and mild day today. High of 60 degrees and it's going to stay sunny all day. It does get colder tonight. It's going to drop down to 41 degrees. And then uh, Friday, still nice out. It's high of 63 expected, but it's going to start getting colder. Uh, it's going to get windier and colder over the weekend. And by next week, we're going to be in the 40s. But we are going to step out for a break. And when we come back, Donald Ng joins us to take a look back on this day in history. Kevin Coleman has an Nutmeg Sports update. And we have more local news coming up after this. This is now 44 years I've been in this business. Digital came along. After I was in business for about six years, I had to totally reinvent the business. So I had to make a tremendous investment in my business. And Milford Bank was there for me. I don't really just consider Milford Bank a bank. I consider them a trusted partner in my business. My name is Jim Wilson, owner of Milford Photo. I choose to bank with Milford Bank. Want to reach new heights in your fitness and health goals? Find what you're looking for at Elevation Spin, Train, and TRX in Georgetown, Connecticut. Elevation Spin gives you purposeful spinning workouts inspired by the road. We encourage monitoring of heart rate and energy zones. Elevation also offers customized personal training with dedicated professionals passionate about helping you reach your goals. And let us motivate you to reach greater performance and functionality with TRX suspension training, using your own body weight for an incredible dynamic workout. Located at 4 Old Mill Road in Georgetown, call Elevation at 203-544-9503 or visit ElevationSpinTrainTRX.com for more.
The leaves are changing, water temps dropping, and the sun is setting a little earlier each day. But there's still a lot of great boating, fishing, and coast time left before we see the first snow. And above all, remember, it's always summer at the Dock Shop. With loads of new fishing tackle and accessories, clothing, jewelry, and home decor, the Dock Shop is just what you need when you start to feel that New England autumn chill. Boater, beach bum, fishermen, or simply love the New England coast, this is a unique place to shop. The Dock Shop, 51 Tokenique Road, Darien, 609 Riverside Avenue, Westport, DockShop.com. This fall, explore the beautiful landscape enhanced by the architectural design and art at the Philip Johnson Glass House in New Canaan. Open for the season now through November 30th, the Glass House is a National Trust historic site that sits on 49 acres of pastoral landscape, comprised of 14 total structures, and a permanent collection of 20th century painting and sculpture, as well as temporary exhibitions. Tours are available on Sunday, Monday, and Thursdays through Saturdays. Advanced reservations are recommended. Visit theglasshouse.org for more information and to get your tickets. I'm Frank Granito. And I'm Donald Ng for the HAN Network. Tune in to Nutmeg Sports Monday through Thursday, where we bring you all the top stories from Connecticut sports. From highlights to player interviews and expert analysis, no one gets you closer to Connecticut's games than Nutmeg Sports. Nutmeg Sports, now Monday through Thursday at 2 p.m. on the HAN Network. We're back on this November 17th edition of Your Coffee Break on the HAN Network, and it's time to take a look back on this day in history with Donald Eng. I mean, Eric was just dying to get over to you. <laughs> well, you know, uh, <laughs> today we, uh, today we uh, look into perhaps the most well-known less-than-honest statement from a guy that was pretty well-known for making them. First, though, we go to 15... 58. Uh, Queen Mary I of, Eliz of England, uh, that would be of course Bloody Mary, dies and is succeeded by her half-sister Elizabeth I. Now after a series of very brief reigns and mass executions over religious differences, the 44-year Elizabethan era was a welcome period of stability marked by a flourishing of the arts and the rise of England's military power, uh, led by William Shakespeare and Francis Drake respectively. Elizabeth never married, which is why she was nicknamed the Virgin Queen. The state of Virginia is actually named after her, making their 45-year-old uh, tourism advertising slogan somewhat ironic. To 1810, Sweden declares war on its ally, the UK, and begins a, the two-year Anglo-Swedish War. Now, I would show you an image from one of the battles, but uh, there weren't any. England simply did not acknowledge that they were at war. In fact, the British continued to use Swedish ports as naval bases in the war against Napoleon. The only casualties of the Anglo-Swedish War? Some farmers rioted after being conscripted to fight an enemy that was completely ignoring them. To 1968, viewers of the Raiders-Jets football game in the eastern U.S. were denied the opportunity to watch the finish when NBC broadcasters switched to Heidi instead. Future NFL television contracts would stipulate that all games be shown to their conclusion in the visitor's home market. Finally, now we go to 1973, Orlando, Florida, for this. And I want to say this to the television audience. I made my mistakes, but in all of my years of public life, I have never profited, never profited from public service. I've earned every cent. And in all of my years of public life, I have never obstructed justice. And I think, too, that I can say that in my years of public life, that I welcome this kind of examination because people have got to know whether or not their president is a crook well, I'm not a crook. I've earned everything I've got. President? That was uh, Richard Nixon there welcoming an investigation into Watergate uh, and declaring he's not a crook. He probably would regret uh, both parts of that, actually, a little bit later on. That is your look back in history for today, November 17th, and I'm Donald Ng. All right, thanks so much, Don. Well, back to local news. Mountainside, an alcohol and drug treatment center seeking a rehabilitation facility on Old West Mountain Road in Ridgefield, requested Wednesday that a public hearing scheduled for Tuesday, November 29th to not to be open to the public by the town's planning and zoning commission until January 3rd. The decision to adjourn following Tuesday night's zoning meeting that was attended by about 100 residents who had concerns about such a facility in a residential zone. Matthew Eakin, Mountainside Executive Vice President, told the press that the decision to adjourn the hearing was made to provide Mountainside an opportunity to meet with neighbors and address their concerns. 
Since the zoning meeting Tuesday night was only to accept the Sunset Hall application, the residents were told to come back for the public hearings. The group left that meeting and held its own meeting in nearby Yanity Gym and had discussions with Ridgefield First Selectman Rudy Marconi, who offered town meeting space on Saturday so the neighbors could continue to learn more and discuss a strategy in opposition. A lot more on that story at the RidgefieldPress.com. But let's throw it over to Kevin Coleman. Kevin, happy to have you in studio today. Yeah, happy to be back. Filling in for Frank. Yes. Of course, he's uh, off in Michigan for a big weekend. But He's having a good weekend. He's yeah. having a good weekend. <laughs> <laughs> but what do you have for us? Uh, it was an exciting uh, CIAC semifinal action we had last night in volleyball in the class double L. It was Ridgefield beating Greenwich three sets to two in a nail biter. And finally, Stanford getting three sets on Amity. We have highlights right here from that Stanford game. The Ridgefield Tigers will take on the Stanford Black Knights in the Class Double L State Final at 4 p.m. on Saturday. In girls soccer, it was the semifinals in Class Double L. Number one, Glastonbury took down number 13, Wilton, 2 0. And in the other matchup, it was the number three, Ridgefield Tigers, continuing to roll as they blanked number two, Suffield, 3 0. It will be the number three seeded Richfield Tigers facing the number one seed Glastonbury in the Class Double L State Final Saturday morning. And in Class L, it was number three St. Joseph's who will advance to the State Final and face number five Massick. Finally, in the field hockey semifinals in Class M, it was New Canaan Rams defeating Brantford 1-0. They will face Guilford in the Class M Final Saturday afternoon. In Class L, it will be an all FCAC Final as the number three seeded Staples Wreckers will take on the number four seeded Darien Blue Wave Saturday morning. That will do it for your Nutmeg Sports update. Be sure to tune in to Nutmeg Sports at 2 p.m. We will preview all eight FCAC teams who will be competing for a state title. Kate, awesome. Back All right. To you. Thanks so much, Kevin. We are going to step out for a break. When we come back, John Kovach joins me, and we're going to preview our HAN Network front pages this week, coming up after this. Connecticut is coming back to hometown banking. To a partner that makes small businesses feel big. Where community comes first. Where high tech tools go hand in hand with a human touch where you get the know-how only neighbors can deliver. Where saving time is important too. It's time to expect more. It's time to bank well, bank smart, bank local, bank well. One, two, three, Abby, you know. I want to find out how good I am. Yes, sir. If you relax, you get blown up. Let's get it done. Let's get it done. Take advantage of right now. Again, come on. I've been pushed myself way beyond what you think. Pressure technique. Bring it back. Are you ready for winter? Ski and Sport has everything you need to be fully outfitted for the season. A family-owned and operated business with over 40 years of experience, Ski and Sport's three convenient locations in Fairfield County offer top quality, high fashion ski and winter wear. In addition to clothing for men, women, and children, we also offer seasonal rentals for the entire family. Stop by our stores on 1 Ethan Allen Highway in Richfield, 877 Post Road East in Westport, and at 110 Main Street in New Canaan, or visit us at skiandsport.net. Washington Pride, now open on Main Street in Georgetown. Come enjoy our relaxed setting, excellent service, award-winning nightly happy hours, and feast on our creative new American cuisine. Connecticut Magazine's winner for best steak, Washington Prime of Georgetown. At InSports Trumbull, the game is always on inside. Recently renovated and home to one of Connecticut's largest indoor turf fields, InSports is a multi-sport recreation center providing state-of-the-art facilities for league play, camps, and youth programs. Sign up now for InSports Fall and Winter Lacrosse Clinics and Leagues. With programs ranging from first grade all the way through high school, there's something for every lacrosse player at all levels. Programs include college coaches clinics, youth box winter leagues, high school winter leagues, and seven-on-seven -seven tournaments. For more information and pricing, visit us at InSportsCenters.com. Like us on Facebook. 
when it comes to local entertainment, we've got it all. From movies, local artists, etiquette, and more. Watch HAN Arts and Leisure with me, Steve Coulter, and our Arts and Leisure editor, Sally Sanders, Mondays at 1230, right here on the HAN Network. I'm John Kovach. I'm a newspaper editor. I'm a high school football coach. I'm a television presenter. And I want you to love fishing as much as I do. Tune into Yankee Fisherman, Thursdays at 1 on the HAN Network. It's like going to the tackle shop without leaving your office. Welcome back to your coffee break on the HAN Network. I'm Kate Chaplinski, joined now by our editorial director, John Kovach, to preview this week's front pages. John. How you been? I've been great. We've missed you in the week. Hi. <laughs> Believe me, I kept busy this week. I'm sure you did. What are you looking at first? I am looking at the Darien Times where the Board of Finance has approved so one step toward the town acquiring 16 and a quarter acres from the Oxbridge Hunt Club for open space. And a look at the election and it's a look back but it's also a look ahead because there's some talk of somebody out of Darien for governor. Ooh, interesting story interesting. there. What are you? All right, Checking I'll take a look at the Trumbull Times. Some big news in Trumbull. The Golden Eagle Marching Band are national champions. They're just an incredible band. They have been, I mean, for as long as I can remember. Uh, so congratulations to them. Very exciting. And I believe next year they're going to be marching in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Very cool. Yeah, very cool. So shout out to them. Uh, also, a honoring on Veterans Day at St. Joseph High School, Trumbull's other high school. Uh, a special ceremony honoring veterans on that day. Of course, more in-depth uh, election day results. Trumbull votes mostly mirroring the state and the country. An interesting story we had on uh, last week's in-game news update, but tax agents uh, bust a Trumbull man seizing cash, fake stamps, and 500 cartons of cigarettes. One of the more impressive Veterans Day ceremonies takes place in New Canaan, where it's on God's Acre. There is a monument that was erected there, I believe, after World War I. Uh, two soldiers in the hopes that there would be no more war. Obviously that has not come to fruition, but they have a speaker on God's Acre and the crowd gathers around the hillside. Really a very moving tribute there. Lisa Milan this year from the uh, Daughters of the American Revolution uh, spoke at the ceremony. Christopher Cogswell of a uh, a veteran of Desert Storm, he addressed those. They always choose a veteran to speak or, or a member of a veteran's family. Very touching ceremony. Uh, story on that on the front page of the New Canaan Advertiser. Also reaction where uh, some local residents are concerned, some hopeful with Donald Trump winning. Now interesting, New Canaan overwhelmingly Republican, yet Hillary Clinton carried the vote in New Canaan by uh, about 1,200 votes and reaction from the first selectman to the charter change that takes the chairmanship of the Board of Finance away from the sitting first selectman. All right, taking a look at the Reading pilot, um, a selectman there stepping down off the board and Democrats will be nominating a replacement. Uh, also some great photos of some Tibetan Buddhist monks uh, who were recently at the Mark Twain Library uh, for a special event, very cool there. Uh, as a story we mentioned earlier, Build the Wall chant reported in Barlow Cafeteria. We talked about that yesterday on Coffee Break. Uh, the principal there saying that those claims unsubstantiated, but was reported by a couple of parents. Into the Woods premiering at Barlow this week, so always great time for uh, local productions. In Weston, First Selectman Nina Daniel is back on the job after her leave. That's been covered extensively by... Patty Gay, editor of the Western Forum. The Norfield tree spared the axe. There was a lot of concern that the tree was going to be cut down because some saw it as a safety hazard. The police commission has approved the design for a new complex in Weston and a presentation by Kevin Briel on depression, but really impressive is that photo of the supermoon that taken at Campo Beach in Westport. Cool. Very cool. I wanted to get a shot of that, just never got out to yeah, do it. That's gorgeous. All right, well, taking a look at the front page of the Wilton Bulletin. Unfortunately, similar to what we heard at Joe Barlow and something we just talked about earlier, but uh, allegedly some Wilton students chanting build the wall at a Danbury football game. There's been a lot of community response to that. Uh, Kendra Baker doing a great story. Be sure to check that out. Uh, veterans honored, of course, last 
Friday at the Veterans Day ceremony. Wilton's planning and zoning also making way for some age-restricted housing uh, in town for future applications. And High School Musical on the stage at Wilton Children's Theater. In Ridgefield, just a great shot of scouts saluting at the Veterans Day ceremony there. Reaction to the election of Donald Trump as president. Neighbors, as you talked about earlier, having some concerns about plans for a rehab facility in a residential neighborhood. A new restaurant coming to Main Street. And Ridgefield looks back at longtime resident, neighbor, actor, scholar, and political activist Robert Vaughn, who passed away. All right, taking a look at the front page of the Milford Mirror. Uh, some more election analysis. Really interesting in Milford, as we talked about last week, John, but it was very close uh, for the top of the ticket between uh, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Clinton ended up taking it in Milford, uh, but it was really only by a couple hundred votes. So very close there. Um, the Eli's patio in downtown Milford approved. They will have a patio on the way, so exciting for them. And a founder's walk may be built by spring that will run alongside the Fowler Memorial Building and down toward Fowler Field. Stratford residents gather every Memorial Day and Veterans Day as they did last Friday at Academy Hill for ceremonies. Some great shots there, those from Brad Durrell. The news that Sandy Hook families are going to appeal to the state Supreme Court seeking the right to sue gun manufacturers for what happened there on that awful December day. Continuing debate over whether the town will or will not pay for an attorney hired by the Water Pollution Control Authority and discussion of transit-oriented development, including how it might affect the former center school in downtown Str uh, Stratford. All right, well, taking a look at the front page of the Easton Courier, some reaction there to local election results, and a sweet picture of best friends Kate and Hayden supporting their opposing candidates, but they still love each other. A submitted photo of that. Very sweet. Uh, veterans honored at ceremony. Easton Police receiving a grant for their canine program. An interesting story by Brad Durrell. Three intersections in Easton accounting for most of the town's accidents. In Shelton, if you're looking for something different in terms of where to go to dinner, Magic Cafe has opened and it features magic as part of the entertainment in addition to what's on the menu. Uh, more units approved for the Shelter Ridge development in Shelton. And what the Republicans win in the state Senate, which forges an 1818 tie, mm. could mean up in Hartford. All that on the front page of the Shelton Herald. All right, on the front page of the Monroe Courier, some more photos of their Veterans Day celebration last week. Uh, in other news in Monroe, the Board of Ed saying that Stepney Elementary needs a new roof and town officials discussing the future of Chalk Hill School and a really wonderful story by Tim Marie Craven about Anthony Katz being named an honorary junior firefighter uh, with Monroe volunteers. Very cool there. And in our arts and leisure section, the Housatonic Museum taking a look at film noir and how to eat healthy this Thanksgiving, that by the conscious cook. All right, maybe a little bit of healthy eating, maybe a little bit of not so healthy yeah, eating. Yes, I have. All right. Yeah. All right, John. Oh, yes, and of course, in our Ridgefield Press this week, we have our Ridgefield Holiday Events Guide. This is an incredible. Uh, little insert that we do because it just is packed with so many events so many great things to do over the holidays i mean ridgefield is like a hub of christmas activity oh, basically. They that tree festival yeah. they do at the old governor's house is so just beautiful. wonderful um so john coming up at one o'clock we have yankee fishermen did some fall fishing up on fife brook in massachusetts we'll find out why it's called fishing and not catching all right and we are going to look at an exhibit that's going on at the fairfield museum and nature center because the kids are going to be home for, well, the better part of five days, let's say. And you might want to get them out. Here's a place you can take them, and it's a very interesting exhibit about the coast and tides, and it all kind of ties together with angling. Very cool, and of course, as Kevin mentioned earlier, Nutmeg Sports at 2 o'clock. Be sure to pick up your local paper today. We're going to wrap things up here on your coffee break, but we'll see you tomorrow at 11. Have a great day.